Hi folks, welcome to another round of conversations with Raghu Vora, founder at Blackstone Valley Group and an investor in Capital Mind. As a disclosure, right from the beginning, anything in this conversation should not be treated as investment advice. It is just opinion that uh, we express on the show. Um, firstly, welcome Raghu and uh, thanks for coming on on the show. So, well, uh, good to be back. Uh, how, how have you been? I see a lot of good work being done by you on Twitter, on Capital Mining. So, exciting times, huh? Yeah, hey, exciting is the word, man. We, we, these markets, they never let us uh, rest easy. Uh, so here we are again, I think just I you know, we want to ask you something specific. You have the, uh, you know, the knowledge of, you know, uh, 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 worldwide fixed income investing. And, uh, you know, I see it's a nice and bright sunny day over there. So I'm going to make it quick. I know you want to probably get, get out and, and, and uh, uh, enjoy the sun. But, uh, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, fixed income as uh, funds, the way they're set up, people keep thinking, oh, all they invest in is bonds. So what do they do? What fix, What do fixed income funds invest in? Right, so that's a great question, right? Uh, most people, if you ask the ordinary guy on the street, they would say, hey, fixed income means they're only investing in bonds. And nothing can be farther from the truth. Uh, uh, to understand this, let's go back a step back as how these funds are set up, right? Uh, when, a, when a fixed income fund is set up, they have to define their core strategy. They have to decide what is there going to be a target uh, AUM, you know, or in the bond world, they known as BUM, <laughs> you know, what's bond under management, uh, you know, how much is that going to be, uh, what is going to be their target criteria, what is the risk return profile, so there are these different setups, but what is more important is that there are a few setups, which is, for example, the mandate. Mm -hmm. You will find, interestingly, most of the fund mandates are given to the managers is very broad. The right. broad mandate means that the fund manager can invest in whatever way he thinks is good. Another thing a lot of people don't uh, know this is that a bond manager can actually go as high as 25% of the total uh, AUM, BUM he has under his management to invest in one particular uh, uh, oh, bond. Oh, you mean issue concentration, okay. Yes, yes. But that's all hidden under the layers of paperwork which you never see the board of trustees sign off and, you know. And again, the bond managers never abuse that. <clears throat> you know, it's, 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 a, it's just to give them flexibility so if there is a whiplash in the market, they can move and react quickly. Mm -hmm. So that is the first part. The second part is that when uh, you look at uh, what can they trade, so they can trade currency or risk, they can trade uh, 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 what you know as an interest rate swap, they can trade a currency swap, they can trade swap options, they can trade collateral debt CDOs, they can trade CLOs, they can even trade preferred stock. And when I say trade, that is invest, buy and sell, buy and sell. They can even go in the repo market. They can even go in market. They can invest in hedge funds or the alternatives, private equity. So there are at least 10 to 15 different instruments which are in a normal uh, course of a day, a bond manager uses to uh, you know, hedge his position, get the higher return, seek alpha. And <clears throat> that is a point where I think a lot of people don't have that information because uh, it's known as safe, you know, once you start knowing, oh, bonds, this manager is investing in swap options, what the hell is swap options, right? Can I, can I do this? <clears throat> so, uh, is it risky? So, I think uh, the media and the bond uh, world has done a very good job of keeping the lid under this. And it, it's not, it's, it's a structural thing and it's a good thing. I think the manager should have the flexibility to invest in whatever instrument they think is necessary. See, sometimes there is excess cash part with it. What's, what's the point of having cash? With you? So they will lend it over or they will lend it for a certain time. Period. Or they will just, you know, sometimes they are negative lambda. So sometimes they have to borrow cash because it's easier to do the carry position in a, in a, for a, a foreign exchange derivative transaction. So they borrow it. So even after interest in carry, they still make some money. So uh, I think that's something which is not widely known or not widely prevalent. Uh, except for the participants in the industry. So, yeah, great question. That's, uh, that's interesting. You know, I mean, in India, we get this uh, uh, 
perhaps some closeted regulation set that decides that for instance uh, bond uh, managers here want uh, mutual fund managers here can't invest in currency derivatives or in uh, uh, perhaps even sometimes bond market derivatives so for instance uh, if there were bond market futures they aren't allowed to invest in them right now because also it's because it's a nascent market early enough for us to be saying okay uh, this is a little scary and you don't want to handle the leverage piece and 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 uh, uh, you know forex is of course beyond uh, uh, limits for most uh, mutual funds in fact for all mutual funds in india as far as i know uh, so is this true worldwide? I, mean, I understand you are looking at uh, some of the American larger funds which possibly handle more money in a single day than all of India's AUM uh, you know, over the year. But would this also be true from a country specific perspective? No, so I think uh, let's make a distinction, right? Uh, mutual funds again can be broad based, right? Uh, uh, and fixed income, equity, what part of that fund is invested where? I think if the fund mandate, and this is where the fund mandate comes in, right? If the fund mandate, as per as the governance, like if as per as the regulation, if SEC allows a certain fund to, you know, participate in different uh, financial instruments, then, you know, the fund has to do that and has to disclose that. You will often find that uh, information in the disclosure statement. Mm -hmm. uh, typically what happens is in mutual funds, since it is uh, very large and highly regulated, um, they tend not to do uh, too much of financial instrument uh, uh, leveraging or trading, right? Because their mandate is very specific. You know, if you're in a long shot Vanguard fund or a Fidelity fund or a Pimco fund or, you know, BlackRock fund, the long shot itself tells you that there is going to be an inherent core hedging strategy within that fund. Now, there is no specific regulation as to say you can't do this, you can't buy because it's a long shot fund, right? So you will have some positions uh, to hedge, some positions to carry. And then overall for the whole portfolio, right, you will still want to have some sort of uh, uh, risk variance there. So if you're looking at, if you're a long shot, but now you're in an emerging market, have to hedge the currency. Right. Mm -hmm. There is no other way you will survive if you don't have a currency uh, hedge out option there. So I think there, there is certain percentages which uh, the bond managers play with to kind of hedge. Um, you know, as you saw what happened when the Frank Swiss Frank uh, episode, right? A lot of people got caught with their pants down mm -hmm. with their, and smart trading desks, right? Banks trading desks. Uh, because they were, they were not hedging, they, they ha had not hedged. So, you know, uh, from a regulation perspective, I think India is overly regulated because of scandals <laughs> and the fear of uh, the retail investor losing all the money. But, you know, <laughs> you look at uh, other scenarios, I think the government is overreaching. Oh, of course, of course. I mean, I think I, I've always been a feeling that, uh, you know, we don't allow a lot of people to do a lot of things just because we're scared that they'll do something and destroy everything. Uh, but uh, obviously that's not true because every time they've opened up markets, our markets have become stronger, not weaker. And uh, it uh, doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that uh, uh, the people in control want to just demonstrate their power rather than give it up and allow the market to determine direction in a lot of these cases. So uh, India is backward, perhaps uh, backward enough. Uh, to warrant uh, lesser attention as it has from uh, uh, foreign players or, or worldwide investors. Yeah, you know, I'll share an interesting uh, tidbit with you. Uh, so, uh, the, the last five years, the two Asian economies which have seen the highest inflows of foreign funds is India and Indonesia. Okay. Uh, India has actually averaged about 19 to 21 billion dollars for the last five years. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Fixed income, this is only on equity side, okay? On fixed income, in the last five, total five years, we just have $29 billion. <laughs> that, and all the, and that, all the overflow is now going into the corporate bonds because no other way to hedge your risk unless you're going and, you know, so all the reliances and the Tata's of the world who have their debentures and, uh, you know, uh, uh, bonds out there, they are seeing the excess flow coming in. 
Well, you, you have a limit, right? $25 billion is the limit on, on government security. So you can't buy more than even if you wanted to. Which is also sad because it's 3% of India's total issues. Right. So, at, at some point, you know, over is uh, really more appropriate here than, you know, uh, anything reasonable. But, um, yeah, I guess, you know, from a, from a fund perspective, you know, when, when you come back to a mandate, uh, what specific things would a fund's mandate restricted from doing uh, versus a regulation? Well, a fund's mandate would uh, prohibit you explicitly uh, in four or five different areas. First, uh, it might prohibit you from geographically uh, investing outside. A lot of sovereign funds in the world have a component. Minimum uh, percentage of that fund has to be invested in local instruments. I see. Uh, some funds are also just mandated to invest in quasi-sovereign offerings. Quasi-sovereign like the Indian railway bond, right? It's I see. Indian, it's a government-owned entity with bond market, right? The other restrictions which come is uh, basically uh, how much can a manager invest in a particular asset class? How much can the fees? That is very important structurally because in the end, some see, some funds are designed for institutions and their fee structure and their investment mandate is different than funds being desired of open for retail investments. Uh, so if you look at both, the, the institutional funds have more uh, flexibility in investing in a range of uh, solutions and a, and a broader mandate. Okay. But the, the funds for, uh, for the retail investor, they tend to have a narrower mandate just as a safeguard. Plus, uh, there is a very important check mark. What is your core strategy? Right? If your core strategy on a disclosure is long short, you cannot go and have 10% position of your fund in an arbitrage, uh, 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 you know, in an arbitrage situation, special situation. You can't have, you know, uh, so there are restrictions which are, which forces a manager to act within a mandate. I see. And uh, which are beyond uh, regulations, right? This is something which a company which launches the bond, uh, the fund does to protect its own self and its investors. Got it, got it. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, we've seen a few funds in India that say you can only invest in funds which are short term uh, by basis of saying I will only invest in, uh, you know, paper that's less than 90 days. And then you have the restrictions on rating. So it says I'll do only AAA or AA plus, um, right. which uh, obviously skew things up because when a company's rating falls below AAA, they have to sell the bonds. But the reason it has fallen from AAA is because people have been selling its bonds. So, it's a double value that happens. Prophecy. So, I guess, you know, a lot of complications come into the mandate as well. Right. So, coming on the ratings, yeah. Ratings, again, but you see ratings, there is Moody's and S&P. Mm -hmm. And then every firm has its own proprietary rating model. So, I think unless, uh, uh, and, and you have flexibility. See, uh, Puerto Rico was never about C. Okay. But investors still went, funds still went and invested there, right? Uh, okay. So, so the, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what is the quality of your uh, product there, right? See, what happens is, uh, again, ratings is a very complex uh, world. Uh, you, have a, you have a top level entity or you have a corporate holding, which has many more holdings, right? For bank, like Bank of America still has offerings from uh, countrywide. Countrywide had issued some... Right, right, right. So there is a lot of slices of that offering and you have to look at each individual slice. You cannot say Bank of America is a, 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 a double A plus because collectively it might not be. You have to look at slicing uh, the, uh, the entities on an individual uh, asset level, QCIP level almost, right? Ticker level. Right. To see what is this individual holdings ratings. And what happens is that gives the flexibility to the managers to say, okay, I am buying Bank of America. But inherently, you are also buying a piece of countrywide, you know. Because if things happen, bad things happen to Bank of America, because of countrywide, you are going to get impacted, right? Right. So. And, and, you know, and the market has discounted or market has not uh, anticipated. So those are, again, the some of the flexibilities the, uh, you know, fixed income guys have. To work on this, you know, whether it's mortgage securities, sovereign, you 
you know, bonds. There are different instruments available for the fund manager. That's great. And Ravi, you know, you briefly touched upon it, I guess, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, we've done Greece, we've done China, we've got uh, uh, Puerto Rico on the radar. So what's happening out there? I think it's again the question of sustenance of, uh, you know, the revenues. Uh, when Whenever you structure a, you know, a country bond or a sovereign bond or a, you look at the revenues and you look at the uh, tax collections, you look at the deficits, you look, you, you project, right? You're projecting that we will be here by this time. Like I was reading a paper on Greece where the from 2014, where those projections are nowhere near uh, in 2015. And again, they are going to do the same thing again, right? So it's basically projections. And then people are taking a, a, a educated guess, right? It's a risk investment. But again, listen, smart money was not there in Greece. That's why you didn't see the impact. Yeah, the media, you know, there is going to be a media uh, impact. But smart money had left Greece a long time ago. Right. right. Basically, the banks and the IMF left holding the bag. Same with Puerto Rico. You know, very few smart money funds, unless they are expressly junk bonds, uh, you know, who, who have a mandate to invest in risky instruments, they have all uh, uh, moved out of Puerto Rico. So, who's holding the bag there? Yeah, a lot of hedge funds do. Oh, I see. A lot of hedge funds do. See, hedge funds again in Greece also, you, you actually need a post stating, right? So hedge funds are very aggressive in taking those bets because their returns are outside, right? Mm -hmm. um, they can they can afford to have a high risk uh, portfolio, some portion of the portfolio with high risk bets because they generally deliver an outside uh, return. So there are hedge funds. There are some local uh, pension funds, you know, whose mandate is that they have to invest in that quality of paper, which is rated, uh, which is issued by a certain uh, governmental authority. Uh, so, see, sometimes investment decisions are bad because of your mandate. You have no choice. Yeah. You, you have to buy what is there in the market. Yeah, if, you have, if you're a Puerto Rican fund, what are you going to do? <laughs> you can't go invest in like... Exactly. So, what happens is, again, I think a lot of the flexibility the bond managers have in um, managing that risk versus return uh, helps them navigate the situation. And again, you know, it was the uh, trifecta weekend, right? Greece and uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, see, Greece, nobody expected the re referendum, but everybody expected a U-turn. Right. Whether the referendum had happened or not, right? Everybody understood political posture. Uh, but it, it, it went on to an extreme level, which kind of created certain... Uh, what you say, certain disappear in the market, certain instability. But uh, let me, people then started talking about, hey, Portugal, Spain, here are some facts. Portugal and Spain, the pigs, right, out of the pigs, mm -hmm. let's pick up Portugal and Spain and Italy. 65% to 70% of their uh, um, sovereign debt is owned by non-domestic holders. I see. So that means they're outsiders who have invested in those funds. Right? So that tells you that there is a lot of confidence of the market participants in saying that these guys will not go the Greek route. Right. Uh, but you know, when you're on media, when you know, now you are a media personality yourself, <laughs> you know, media likes to create headlines, right? They want to have people's attention and they will say, oh, Greece is now exiting out of Euro and it's, you know, uh, we have had papers written on Greece exit, but, uh, you know, in the end of the day, as I talked about last time. It is death by thousand cuts. And it's going to get worse. Nobody is ever going to be happy. Uh, but there is there are structural changes. See, 96% of uh, the people who are eligible to pay income tax in Greece don't do it. No, don't like India. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, you, you can uh, come protest on the streets and complain about austerity, but, you know, you get pension guaranteed at 50-55. Uh, things have to change and there is pain there, right? Nobody wishes bad for uh, other people, but there is pain and uh, it's the people, the government and the organization who should come and kind of, uh, you know, uh, get a solution out there. So, you know, in a nutshell, that is Greece. I don't think so. Again, it's impact on Portugal or Spain. Uh, mm -hmm. The quality of their paper is really high and people have started investing in those countries again. Uh, so I think Greek will be the sore eyesore of EU. And well, let's see how the the structure goes. I guess they've started on austerity, 
uh, it's going to be fun to watch well not fun from a fun perspective being greek uh, i'm sure it's not fun for anybody in greece but uh, what's really happened is a lesson in uh, a lot of ways to a lot of people the the a level that uh, greece had had to stoop to uh, in eventually in order to stay within the confines of the euro and them almost realizing right at the end that without uh, 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 without any of these uh, euro support they would actually be dead in the water that that realization i think came in a little late uh, after much of the political posturing was also but uh, you know interestingly this is become a line of thinking you know you got elections in spain later that said uh, we we will not probably have to vote left or extreme left uh, at some point uh, much of the that must have gone away so the economic has become the political now so Great. that's that's the sea change you know you know if you look at uh, history of sovereign uh, defaults whether it's cyprus or whether it's argentina and now greece uh, those countries always will struggle uh, coming back in the international diaspora uh, because you know uh, you know uh, you know pull me once shame on you pull me twice shame on me right it's like people are very skeptical see argentina is again people don't talk because it's you know a uh, very minuscule part but they are involved in uh, 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 so sovereign uh, disputes all over the world with hedge funds with government authorities you know what that restricts the ability of the people to come in the common place and it restricts the ability of the funds to come into it. absolutely i mean I, undoubtedly it's one of the no argentina is one of the only country that has managed to default twice in the last 10 years i don't know how it's managed to do that but you know greece has done it what five times in the last four two three hundred years or uh, so uh, but you know it, this is uh, this is probably the interesting part of uh, global economics that uh, 20 years ago if you told me that greece defaulted i would literally let's say so what and now it is like it's got implications on india and it's got implications in china and uh, you you realize the 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 global nature of the world and i guess that makes that global bond fund also so much more complicated to manage because you don't know where something is going to come from that impacts you exactly so see again you know there was a, a question asked to me on twitter about you know diversification and you know the basically the respondent was hey look at you know uh, rakesh junjunwala or some of the other you know dolly khanna's portfolios and they have diversified across you know equities and i have my question to him was was how how are you managing this you are still in the same asset class you still in equities you not even gone beyond equities right so i think there is this misconception that if i diversify within an asset class my risk is hedged the second misconception is that i need to if i you know between a mix of fixed income and equities my risk is again hedged which is not the case so because fixed income is very highly correlated to equities market for example if you look at the interest rate curves the large caps are correlated with the uh, longer term uh, uh, treasuries mm -hmm. and the small caps are actually negatively impacted so you know you, it doesn't matter if you have a portfolio with 10 uh, equities and three you know long long funds and three short funds the correlation factor is what matters so uh, when uh, people when fund managers look at a global perspective they are looking at gdp inflation you know we spoke last time sovereign risk political risk geopolitical risk on a macro level then they are trying to decompose that risk and say what is the smallest factor of this risk i can get to and then they try to build their portfolios from a factor perspective it's more based on the arbitrage pricing theory model than rather than the efficient you know the markowitz model or the cpm model if you are building a, a global bond fund that's the macro level risk you have to take and then asset class specific right duration curve yield curvature these are all the you know then the asset class specific risk. so basically you are decomposing macro and asset class factors bringing it together and saying how correlated is my portfolio I see. Again, you know, institutions do this for a longer term perspective. They are not take this. They are not trading. They are building a portfolio for, let's say, pension funds. So they are building it for, you know, retirement funds. 
<clears throat> so they're looking at 10, 15 years uh, horizon, where for the pension funds, you know, uh, also a term uh, for liability-driven investing, right? You have to have X, Y. You always have to be 90 or 95 percent um, close to your uh, ratio for the li li uh, pension funds to pay out, right? Right. So the payouts happen at certain. So when a global bond manager is building those funds, and you know Singapore, Tamasek invest, Australia invest, Dubai invest, Abu Dhabi invest, Norway invest, he has to take into consideration all those things and say what happens, right? I have an oil shock now mm -hmm. from a supply side. First time ever in the history of the world, we have a supply shock uh, from oil. Every other shock was a demand shock. But as in too much supply versus too little. Yeah, so right now we have too much supply, right? That's why the price is impacted. This was the first time it has happened. In the previous shocks, the shock was all on the demand side. So you saw oil spike to 140, 180, wherever it went, right? So so what is the supply chain impact of this? So when a global bond manager is looking at all these things, he's also looking at structuring his portfolio that it can manage this, right? <coughs> it can manage these shocks. Mm -hmm. See, what is... Uh, typically happened is you could predict hey you know this is a bubble now you know <laughs> they are saying there's a VC bubble in uh, US but the thing is the reality is due to the global correlation in the markets we are going to see whiplash events we might not see black swan events but we are going to see whiplash events and what it means is that you are going to see a sudden unexpected correction in the market on the other direction I see so, in a in way, sorting out the bubbles by using small, rapid corrections, uh, rather... Correct. Totally unexpected. You know, you will never, you know, it's not it's not in the horizon. And it happens because it gets triggered by some news or, you know, out of these four or five uh, sectors. Let's say, um, you know, uh, I tweeted about the U.S. market economy really coming back forth on the new orders, the inventories of the CPI, right? They are coming back up. Let's say tomorrow, uh, next month, that number goes down drastically. Maybe it's an academic error, right? We don't know. Maybe it's a data collection error. But you can imagine what that news can do to the uh, markets, right? You will have a whiplash effect. So I think the uh, managers are trying to build their portfolios in such a way that they can withstand this in-duration shocks and not have to rebalance. But what that means is they it, it becomes a very intense management uh, on their part. Yeah, because really, if you have the unexpected, you are going to lose money on the expected. So as long as things are within range, your returns are going to be substandard in that in that context. Correct. So it's not that you can just uh, invest in a treasury bond and walk away and your work for the day is done. So it's more intensive. Ah, I see. So this is interesting because it gives you a perspective. Uh, and you know, largely for us, we look at this almost with awe because uh, hardly any of us get to see a perspective of this uh, sort. And uh, if we are still coming up in the in the bond market, so I'm sure there's a lot more to learn from uh, stuff abroad. So, on that note, uh, thanks very much, Raghu. I think it's been a great time conversing. Thanks for coming on the show, and uh, uh, we'd love to have you again. We will have you again. Uh, you have invested in us, so you know you don't have a choice. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep coming back. But thanks again. Thanks for coming on to the show and. Uh, uh, to all of you uh, who listen, please uh, please uh, feel free to uh, comment or mention, come on to the Slack group if you're a premium member and, and tell us uh, more. We will uh, uh, post, uh, 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 we will take questions and we'll have more, anything more that you need to know, we'd love to answer. Uh, thanks again for coming on the show and uh, have a great day. You too, man. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.